And she was like, you're going to ride him through the fire and you're going to do it now. So, let's go back to your beginning and your beginning. Okay. <laughs> How did you guys get involved with horses? Where did it all start for you? I was kind of born into it. Uh, my mom, I have a twin sister, so when we were born, my mom was managing a small local show barn around here, and that was the first 13 years of our lives, was um, that. <laughs> Mucking stalls and oh, yeah. working the horses. Yep. Yeah. If we wanted to play in the pond, we had to clean our certain amount of stalls first. <laughs> That's <awesome. laughs> If it wasn't good enough that we would nap in the stall, we'd have to come back down from catching tadpoles. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> <That's awesome. laughs> Can you see my mom doing that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> That's we good. got in trouble. We'd have to go pick rocks out of the paddock. <laughs> oh, my God. That is funny. <laughs> Awesome. And then um, you went to Canada, right? Yeah. So, so when we were probably around in fourth grade, um, a really good friend of my mom's bought a horse from a breeder in Canada and asked if we all wanted to go on a road trip. And my mom hit it off with her, the breeder. Yeah. And that was that was his the rest is history <laughs> she they uh my mom would take we'd go up every couple of months my sister and i would get thrown on all kinds of horses from anything with 10 rides on it to and you were like 13 14 no 15. we were eight <laughs> you were eight you were eight when you went up there yeah. the trainer yeah and was this trainer like known or yeah what, yeah. what were they known um in like what discipline um, she had started off breeding uh, good quarter horses and then she got into breeding Clyde thoroughbreds and she was kind of refining the breeding and making them more the sport horses that you see a lot of today yeah um, her goal was to make like the ultimate amateur meter 10 horse so like a three six jumper type thing okay um, but amateur friendly you know not as hot-blooded as some of the warm bloods or the thoroughbreds could be it was nice quiet fox hunting there were a lot she sold into the fox hunting down here down virginia all over um so my mom would go up and every couple of months and they'd throw us on all kinds of horses and they'd make these sale videos on the vhs tapes <laughs> <laughs> and they would don't age like, yourself now girl it's so quiet <laughs> that the little kids can ride it <laughs> that was the selling point right yeah yeah, so, so friendly was, your baby could ride. Yep. yep. And my sister and I, we'd like ride some horses and then we'd be like, they used to have a racetrack, quarter, mi or quarter mile racetrack. And our reward for riding all of the horses was we got the keys to the golf cart. Oh. We could do as many laps now as we wanted around the racetrack. <laughs> you had a variety of horses, but we you still wanted to steer them. Oh. <laughs> that is rich. I love yep. that. That's that was awesome. our reward. We'd do laps around the racetrack until the battery was dead. <laughs> it died at the end. <laughs> uh, yeah, sometimes that was. That's the, awesome. You know, I push Marvin home all the time. I had practice. <laughs> that is awesome. That is awesome. Yep. Very, so how long were you in Canada? Like, did you eventually live up there and keep training? Or yep. like so um, when we were around 12, we started spending, like, you know, you have school vacations. Every school vacation, my mom would drop us off on one weekend, pick us up the next. Wow. Um, we spent our summer vacations up there. What part of Canada was it? Um, Freelton, Ontario. It's kind of a little place between Hamilton and Toronto. Oh, cool. Um, small town, but a big horse town. Okay. Lots of barns. So, yeah, every summer vacation. And then when we were 13... They started a uh, sale where every May they would sell 30 to 50 horses. Wow. And they were three to six years old. Every now and then we'd have two-year-olds in there. And they'd bring them in, put 30 days on them, and then auction them off. 
except two weeks before the auction date, you had to, they had to be safe enough that everybody and their kids could come and try them. (laughs) (laughs) Got it. So when they started doing the auctions, my mom fought with the school to let us take a month off because she was like, well, this is what they love to do. This is their passion. It's probably where their careers are going to be. So, and the schools were pretty good about it. That's amazing. Yeah. Coordinate with all of our teachers to get all of our work, take a whole month off and workhorses. Were you like in heaven because you were able yeah, to do this? Yeah, it was like every still- April would roll around, we'd come out of winter and you'd be like, it's going to be sale time soon. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. And then you get back at the end of May and you got two weeks left of school. and <laughs> That's awesome. Most of the time the teachers, you'd get back and you didn't have everything done and they'd be like, it's fine. That's like every <laughs> barn rat's dream right there. That's like, yeah, it was that's pretty like good. what every little <laughs> pony girl wants to do. <laughs> It's awesome. pretty good. <laughs> That's awesome. And so that transcended into young adult and... Yep. When I was 20, um, I moved up there. Uh, I lived there for almost six years, five and a half years. And then um, my dad ended up having a heart attack. So I moved home. Um, That's tough. Yeah. I kind of figured wherever I went in life, there was always going to be horses, but I yep. wasn't always going to... You know, I didn't have five and a half years of hanging out with him, so. Right. I don't know if I really see him more now or. (laughs) (laughs) Life got busy, but yeah. yeah. Cool. So I came back home and. And you had that whole history of experience that I'm sure any barn was like. Oh yeah. Signing you up. It was great. I I, I had a lot of really fortunate opportunities in Canada and a lot of really wonderful people. That's awesome. A lot of really wonderful people that taught me a whole lot along the way. So very cool. Yeah. Now, is there a distinct difference between like the way that Canada, the can Canadian horse world is <laughs> or, and, and the, uh, American horse. I mean, even in America, there's like a diversification of yeah. how people trade, but is there, there like is. a different style of handling yeah. and stuff? Um, not so much handling. I'd say like your young horse development and whatnot. I've never been to Europe, but if I were to compare it, I would say it's what I've heard uh, is more like Europe. You know, Practices, you have horse yeah. shows that are, are built and generated around rider development and young horse development. And I find a little bit more in this area, you're catering a little bit more to a specific type of person that's chasing points to try and reach a final, not so much developing young horses, green riders, that type of thing. So they're not like, it's almost like they're not putting the horse first, they're putting their ultimate uh, goals <laughs> with yeah. the horses first. So, yeah. It's, it's hard because, you know, a lot of the places around there, there's stepping stones at horse shows where you can, you know, you get a horse that's comfortable here and it, they set you up. Right. That it's really easy to progress him into the next level, whereas around here, I don't find it's as common. Gotcha. Gotcha. Very cool. Or you got to have a lot of money to do it around here. Right. <laughs> a lot. Yes. <laughs> a lot. A whole lot. lot. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what about you, Davinia? What's your background like? Where, where, where did you start? Um, so I kind of grew up in the horses as well. Um, my mother was an avid animal lover, and um, my dad grew up on a dairy farm. And when he left the dairy farm at like 16, he said he'd never own another animal ever again. <laughs> <laughs> but my mother had to have a Percheron mare. So there was an article, there was an advertisement in the Hartford Current of a Percheron mare in full. And my mother had to have it, so they bought the mare in full, and then they started getting really interested in the breed, um, and they went to some breed events. They went to the World Protron Congress in Kansas City, um, and they saw all the hitch horses, they saw all the halter horses, they saw all the, the multiple hitches, you know, carts, uh, teams, unicorns, fours, and the sixes. Um, and they got really really interested in the breeding and the showing. Um, And I was five years old when they went to some of those events. And um, they went to some auctions, some uh, draft horse auctions out west. And they bought some mares, some really high quality mares. um, And they bought a stallion. Um, And it kind of 
blossom from there. At the high point, we had 72 head of registered Percheron horses. Holy smokes. We'd have 12 foals a year, <laughs> sand, three stallions. That was the high point. Of, wow. Um, and it was, it lasted probably, um, probably they were breeding for probably close to 20 years, 15 or 20 years wow. they were breeding. Um, and was there a particular line that your parents stuck with that um, Yes, true? yes. Um, there were, we were fortunate to have some mentors, Gerald and Melissa Allabach and Abe and Mary of Windermere Farms. Um, they helped us kind of through some of the breeding and purchasing stallions. Um, uh, they were some mentors for us, for sure. That's awesome. Um, so then um, they were started showing them they started showing their horses, um, and we showed all throughout shows in the Midwest, kind of on the East Coast, for probably, um, I don't know, seven or eight years. Every year we'd go, and my school, the Glasses High School system, <laughs> wasn't, quite, Another school story. wasn't quite as understanding as uh, South Windsor. Ended up being homeschooled. Oh, okay. I was homeschooled from sixth grade through eleventh grade. Okay. Um, sixth grade through eleventh, and I'd stay home and train horses. Wow. Seven days a week because we were showing a six horse hitch. Um, wow. Eventually, the six that we had were all homebred horses, and five of them were from our stallion Windermere's Gladiator. So that was kind of a feat at the time because wow. most people were buying horses. They weren't breeding them themselves. Some people do breed them themselves, but it was quite the feat. Five of the horses were Windermere's Gladiator's offspring, um, and they were all born on our farm. Wow. So we showed that hitch for two or three years. Um, That's awesome. Like we'd bring 14 horses on the road and not think anything of it and go all the way to Virginia to show horses wow. or up in Maine or Vermont. Um, yeah. The Big E is always a big show for us. Yeah. Um, it's the closest one. Yeah, for sure. Did you guys show the Royal? Or? We were going to go one year and then... The it, Royal's in Canada. So oh, got it. Got it. <laughs> it's like the big finale I've heard of, of the year. Yeah. I've yeah. heard of drafts. Huge. Um, hundred jumpers. Yeah, it's yeah. big. Driving horses. Yeah. Yeah. Big event. Yep. Yeah. yeah. We never made it. We no. were going to go something... I think they started thinking about it too late and the entry... I think the deadline had passed. Yeah. I think. And they have limited stalling there because yes. they have two levels. Yeah, it's a stables. split level. It's a split, because it's right in the city. It's right yeah. in the heart of the city. Oh, boy. It's a split level, and you have to walk, some of the horses, you have to walk up a ramp. Mm -hmm. And then, so that it's like open, and yeah. then you have stalls all around, and then you have to go up a ramp. Holy smokes. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. amazing. <laughs> That's insane. Yeah. So to be a part of, yeah. for sure. Well, Even definitely. just to go visit. Yeah. Uh, I think they keep cool. the majority of the draft horses. That on might be level. on my bucket list. <laughs> I think at they keep some all point. Yeah. drafts on that. No, no, there were hitches upstairs. I, I, I wow. remember Belgians sliding down the ramp one year. <laughs> yeah, I couldn't see it. Maybe wow. that's why they're all downstairs. <laughs> there you go. There you go. They might not be. They might Very still be cool. upstairs. I don't know. It's been a few years since they've run it now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What's it? Two, two years. Two years. Probably they haven't run it. That's awesome. So. Uh, where did where did um, your your parents and you kind of branch off and did you start doing your own thing or did you stick with them until a certain time or we had to sell our farm uh, my parents got divorced um, and we sold the farm and then right now I'm based at my grandfather's farm luckily he had a hundred and eighty acre farm as wow well. <laughs> um, all right so set you right up that's awesome so I was able to keep. Um, some of our bloodlines and my stallion that I have now is from one of our best mares and um, a stallion that we had or before um, so when we moved to the new farm it was probably with I would say 10 horses I believe um, and then I took it over so for the past 12 years now, they've been mine. Wow. Completely mine. Um, and I have, luckily, that, 
that one stallion has been exceptional. Wow. Exceptional <laughs> producer. That's uh, awesome. Purebreds and crossbreds. Yeah. Coach on thoroughbred crosses. Wow. So My I, sister has one of the crossbreds, and he's one of the most stunning horses you'll ever see. Did I work on him? Turbo. Yes. Yep. Yeah. That's oh my gosh. stallion. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. He was never mind a delight to work with, yeah. but stunning. Like yep. I was just staring at him yeah. the whole time. I'm like, oh my gosh. Enzo's Beautiful. A really, really neat stallion. Yeah. yeah. He really is. Yeah. That's awesome. It's amazing he can produce purebreds mm -hmm. of high quality that he does and the crossbreds. Yeah, breads. and I think the temperament. That's just he like could. based it's on both. It's That's unmatched. just based on like chromosomes though, right? Like based on whatever they throw or whatever mare. Like is it more on the mare he, side or? I've seen him mellow out some pretty yes. up mares. My mom's mm -hmm. mare is not an easy mare and look how lovely Turbo yeah, is. I mean, he, he, yeah, he's mellowed Enzo just throws consistent temperament. Mm -hmm. Wow. Like, and is that, no matter what you breed him common, to, that, right? No, that's no, not common, know. especially with drafts, yeah. right? Like, Cause, well, well, a lot of horses, I mean, it's more the mare than the stallion, but right. Enzo really, really, He's consistent. Yeah, I mean, everything is consistent. Is yeah, the trainability awesome. is unbelievable. I've never seen. No, one of one of them, one of the crossbreds is a police horse, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. He was That's down awesome. in Washington, wasn't he? Yep. Yeah. Very cool. Yep. That's awesome. So, did you? So from there, you you have these twelve <clears throat> at your grandfather's place. Yeah. Yeah. I had I had thirty at one point that was wow. my high point and that's never gonna happen that's so <laughs> that's a load of work is what that is it's a lot of work for one person well, yeah because exactly, i'm doing it myself so right one, right one spring i had five falls and i was cleaning stalls till midnight almost oh i believe it spring and summer wait you did everything everything are you kidding me yeah, i had five falls myself and it was a lot it yeah lot. one crossbred and four um, Pertrons. Oh my god. That wasn't 30. that long ago. No. I think that was the year I moved home. Yeah, probably. Wow. I've downsized since then. I like to keep it at around 15. <laughs> I would hope. <laughs> I would hope. 15 is a good number. 10 yeah. is probably even better. Right, 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 right. <laughs> um, that's, that's a lot. Yeah. That's so, a lot for sure. So I have some uh, purebred Pertrons still. And yeah. then I do some riding horses, some project horses, and train and sell. Cool. Um, and then now I work at Brad Brook with Frisians. That's <laughs> and awesome. And driving horses. Continue to driving horse training yeah. here. Awesome. So you so currently your focus is mainly mm -hmm. driving and training drivers? Yes. So yep. people come here and they can learn through you yep. how to drive and, and that kind of thing. Yep. And then I still have three falls coming this spring. Holy <laughs> smokes. Oh. At my farm. Yeah. It couple doesn't weeks. stop. A couple weeks. Yeah. Wow. Fall watch is coming. <laughs> Wow, yeah. that's pretty incredible. Very Winter cool. It's coming. Full it's coming. Just coming. <laughs> it's coming. What are what are some challenges that you guys have faced in your journey with horses that really kind of shaped how how you are training the horses, but also people? What are some things that I'd you say guys? People have, are the biggest challenge. Yeah, yeah. Tell me more. You know, you have some people that are really open minded, and. Uh, open to whatever way that you you have and then you have other people that want to come in and tell you they want it done a certain way and I mean that's and that's fine it's all workable and manageable it's just some methods are correct for a certain horse some methods are not <laughs> right you know sometimes you'll get a horse in there that's a spoiled brat and it's because of mom or dad <laughs> right right and you can make suggestions but and you can do so much with the horse but if the owner can't follow up with the consistency too mm -hmm. then there's a disconnect there because if i'm working with it two days a week let's see say but they're working with it four days a week the consistency is more in that and if they don't want to follow a program or like something that you've suggested or, or put in place that gets tough. Right. So it's kind of like a lack of like self-awareness and like moldability, I guess you could say. Yeah. Right? And don't get me wrong. There's a lot of people that, you know, they want to change and they, and they're willing to learn, but there's some people that are stuck in their ways too. And you have to navigate that with yeah. silk gloves yes. sometimes. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Yeah. 
So would you say people, it's basically just like the conditioning of some people that are getting involved with maybe your training style or somebody else's and, and kind of coming together in a peaceful way where everybody's growing and yeah. seeing results and yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, you get a lot of different personalities involved too. And oh, yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. If, in the horse industry, there are multiple personalities, sometimes all in one person. <laughs> yes. Yes, there are. And they go on a special list. Yes. A very <laughs> special list. <laughs> I mean it in the nicest way. I really the do. nicest. I mean, I'm way. sure in every every different thing out there, you know. Yeah. I, I've heard I have friends that are dog trainers, and they're like, "You think horse people?" <laughs> yep, yep. And I, I can't I can't say I have some really phenomenal owners too that you yeah. work with that are just you know they're willing to do whatever it. But takes. you see them like ascend, yeah, because of their pliability, I guess. Yeah, you'd say, right. Yeah. Their ability to learn and yeah. grow and develop and mm-hmm. stuff like that. Yeah. Talk about an experience in the horse world early on when you didn't have the confidence and self-esteem that you do now. And what did you do to create more confidence as you were excelling in your journey with horses and training and that sort of thing? What are some things that you did to create more of that like self-esteem and also confidence with horses? Do you want the first story that comes to mind? First story. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> so the woman that um, we grew up riding with in Canada, and I have nothing bad to say about her. She was a, she is a phenomenal woman, a phenomenal horsewoman. Yeah. Um, and their place was a lot like last resort place for a lot of horses too. Dangerous, all that kind of stuff. So you saw a lot of different like methods. labeled horses kind yeah. of thing. Yeah. But you knew a lot of those methods were like, ex- some of them needed to be extreme because of the animal that was there, but I will never forget. And um, she was maybe four foot 10 and the scariest human being you will ever meet. They come in small packages. <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> they do. <laughs> and um, <Scariest. laughs> one, of my, one of our first few visits up there, we were trying to get a video of this horse and his name was Scotty. And the ring was up front and right next to the ring. They had cleaned out an old house and they were burning everything. Oh, good God. Well, this three-year-old Clyde Cross was a little afraid of the fire. And she said, well, if he's afraid of it, ride him through it. Oh my gosh. (laughs) I'm like nine years old. I'm like, I can't ride him him through the fire. Are you kidding me? She was like, you're going to ride him through the fire and you're going to do it now. Oh my God. And I was like, panicking. Ladies and gentlemen, do not try this at home. No. I don't care how old you are. Don't do it. I'm like panicking and I'm looking at my mom and I'm like, this lady's crazy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got pulled off the horse and she rode him through the fire and it was all fine. Yeah. But, um. (laughs) <laughs> that was an instance that like it was an instant maybe I was demolished like, yourself I was like it. yeah I was like are all people like this do I have to be like crazy to ride horses yeah <laughs> so what did that what did that, that, that do first what is the story that yeah. came to mind yeah yeah um, yeah no it was uh you, but you, I mean, you kind of went with your instinct, right? You didn't do it. No, I didn't because in my head I'm going, well, horses naturally are afraid of fire. And you kind of want them to be. You do, but if you <laughs> ever grew up around old school, because when I was a kid, she was already, I, I believe she's into her 70s now. Wow. Um, you know, they came from a family. She's third or fourth generation horsemen, you know, that town that they lived in was built yeah. around her family, yeah. all that kinds of stuff. You know, back in the day, horses you had, had to do what you had to do. Yeah. yeah. So then that was her upbringing and her background. And, you know, yeah, they're naturally afraid of fire, but I guess when before cars and everything, <laughs> you kind of needed them to push through these minor yeah. setbacks. Yeah. Which maybe not so much in today's world, but right. um, we're still talking. This was tw- over 20 years ago. Right. So, um, but that was how 
those horses were so incredibly bomb-proof by the time they left there, and it was, you know, they, they had no choice. Yeah, they used to be a trampoline outside the round yeah. pen, and my sister and I would jump on it, and we'd be doing all kinds of things, and somebody would come around the corner with a young horse, and we'd stop, and it was, no, keep going. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Get them, um, get them used to seeing these odd things. Yeah, I don't know if that experience in particular gave me confidence. Maybe it did in, like, you having your own power and operating from your own power. Yeah, I guess so. Because knowing you could have gullibly said, I'm a young kid, I'm invincible, (laughs) I'll do it, and then your leg gets fried. (laughs) Like, right? I mean, you could have gone that way, and she could have completely had that influence on you. But I guess what you can take away from that is knowing your own limits, too. Yes, and that's, like, And being comfortable within your own limits, because if you're not comfortable with something, don't do it. Right. Um, I do a lot of things that most people aren't comfortable with, but you probably won't see me riding a horse But you've fire probably <laughs> built that, right? Yeah. Like, foundationally, you've yeah. built that. And maybe it was kind of based off of knowing where I was comfortable and where I could push certain things and yeah. get comfortable with other things. and Yeah. Cool. I like that story a lot. I love that story. Actually. What about you? You got any fun barn stories there about building confidence when you I, were younger? I think I was more confident when I was younger. Because yeah. yeah. When I was well, you're dealing with these huge horses and you're this little thing. Well, definitely when I was younger. I you don't was know working, the consequences, you know. Well, that was one thing. And then when I was younger, I was only working with horses we had raised. Or yeah. horses that were... Art, that, on an off chance we had bought that were already very well trained. Wow, okay. So I was working with horses to get them fit for a show ring. Some of them were already broke. They came to us broke. Or young ones that had a completely blank blank, blank slate, but I raised them from a right. baby. You right. Know, we had everything to do with mm-hmm. them raised from... That's always so nice. Until they were <laughs> two and a half years old. And then when I tried... When I was trying to make my own business with the horses, I had to deal with everyone else's problems. Mm, right. Everything that they were bringing gotten away, into it, yeah. gotten away with everything. That's I maybe worked. one of your challenge. One of the challenges. Yeah. One of the biggest challenges. Yep. It's always easier to get a blank slate mm-hmm. than yep. somebody conditioning the horse or abusing Fixing. the horse. Yeah. Right. Like well, coming always, from trauma. Yeah. Yeah. It's always easier creating your own masterpiece than fixing somebody else's slip ups, you know? Yeah. Right. Cause yeah. you don't, you might not know everything that was yep. done. So then yeah. you're really like blinded. Oh, definitely. Mm-hmm. I started working at a horse rescue, um, a couple days a week, uh, the Connecticut draft horse. Wait, rescue. on top of the 30 horses that you're managing. Yeah. yeah. She, I don't know how she lives her life. <laughs> Do you have multiple people that are just you or something? We were, we were in Indiana last week Yeah. and it's late at night. I know what she does every day in a day. Yeah. And she pulls a book out. I'm like ready for bed. She pulls a book out and she was, I want to read the book chapter in my book. And I was like, what I book don't are understand you how you do all the things that you do in a day for yourself, the other businesses, Bridlebrook, everybody else. I was like, and then you go home at the end of the day and you pull a book out. <laughs> You're like, I need to absorb. I was, I was like, mind blown. That's amazing. I was, I was, yeah, that's pure awesome. admiration for your adult status that you would. It's not time management. It's me management is what it's called, right? I don't have any of that. That's awesome. That is cool. What book are you reading right now? It oh, she a, finished it. Yeah. She couldn't put it down. <laughs> it was kind of a fiction, like about like Norse mythology type things, like all the. <laughs> On top of all the other stuff, yeah. she's like expanding yeah. her her gray matter in her brain. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, that's awesome. Oh yeah, she, you're full of all kinds of random facts that I'm like. <laughs> All my books that School I read. School didn't teach me that. That's awesome, though. <laughs> they probably taught it in May when I wasn't there. Yeah, you barely went to school. You were in Canada the whole time. That's amazing. That's awesome. Very cool. So did you have any, like, hang-ups when you were young that, like... If I mean you were already you you said you were already confident, but did anything happen that maybe made you think, like, ooh, maybe I don't 
know if I can do this particular thing. Did some, like working with those huge pressure rounds, I mean. Well, in horses, you learn something new every day, mm-hmm. right? Every single day, mm-hmm. you yeah. have to learn something new. Yeah. Um, yeah. But yeah, younger, I was definitely more confident. When I was start, when I went off on my own, kind of, I had to, I worked at the draft horse rescue. Yeah. And those were all horses that had been, you know, either abused, neglected. Um, so they, or feral. When I first started there, they had five feral clad sales that I, mm. a, a grown adult that horses weren't that touched, were, that were not touched. They were completely oh feral. My gosh. And I broke most of them to, to ride and a couple of them to drive. Wow. I had to figure out how to do it. And, and that, that was, was a probably the biggest that, challenge. That was a big challenge. You know, a couple of them went on to really great homes. Um, but it was a challenge to figure out how to work with a completely feral. 10 year old horse who's huge that nobody ever handled lived with a cow pasture wow so that was that was a test on every ability that i had and abilities that i needed to learn yeah (laughs) that was a test what were what were some of those abilities that you developed in in that kind of a challenge space with those clydesdales Um, that you didn't already have from growing up with that more thinking of Thinking out of the box of different mm-hmm. different ways to do things and different <clears throat> things to do and just yeah. so just like like tactical stuff yeah, like yep. like different ways of doing different uh, ways of groundwork different ways of different ways to desensitize them of things because mm-hmm. you know, they're feral don't, you don't know what what they're spooky see at or what they're not yep. sales that are feral. Just don't see that yeah. every day. No, that no. Was in the news Especially when they allow them to get that big, and the, you yeah. know, there's no awareness of personal space and things like. That. It's a lot different than working with a pony or even a light horse. What was their temperament like when they were feral? Were they like sweet and soft, <laughs> or were they very like don't no, come near me? Very standoffish. Really, incredibly standoffish. Wow. Yeah, the volunteers there did an incredible job of the everyday handling of them mm. and trying to like be their friend but they didn't think they didn't know anything about humans right they just they they had to learn everything they had wow. to learn how to lead they had to learn how to get haltered they they had to learn all of it that's incredible yeah it was definitely nothing that i've ever experienced you know i you start things as a fall and teach mm. to lead mm-hmm. you know it was a totally new way of thinking yeah definitely a totally new way of thinking Wow. And I think too, like not to circle back to the, mm. to the challenges, yeah. but I think too, when, when you hit a certain point in your career that you think, all right, I'm going to go out on my own. And I, I kind of became a professional by accident. <laughs> <laughs> I, I never really wanted to be a professional, but you know, you're in a position where there's people that could use help with their horses and you know how to go. There's about so certain much, things. you know, yeah. from yeah. your experience. Yeah. 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 But, you can't always offer your time for free that eventually you're like, I kind of have to like, right. I kind of have to start getting compensated. You know, I wish I could be an amateur again, but I think the biggest thing is when you do make that decision is the first thing you do is you start to question yourself mm-hmm. yeah. and, you, and then you get, you lose Definitely. a little bit of confidence yep. at first. Like, is like, it like an imposter syndrome thing? Do you think? Maybe. Like you yeah, feel like, I don't know if I'm, yeah, cause you, if you I have the sauce, a, you, <laughs> like, yeah. you know, cause you, you know, like you walk into a barn, I've always like, before I was kind of based out of this place, I'd kind of float around. Somebody over here would need some help. I'd go into a barn and there'd be other people working and you kind of watch and you observe and you're like, well, I wouldn't do it that way. And then you're like, am I doing it wrong? Are they doing it wrong? Is there more than one way to skin a cat? Like, yeah. <laughs> But I think when you first make that decision, you definitely question everything you're doing. You're like, do I really know what I'm doing here? Or am mm-hmm. I just And that's out a of my super mind? common thing. <laughs> I feel like as professionals, I think we yeah. all feel but, that way, yeah. you know? But then, you know, one day you wake up and you're like, I gotta have, you have to have confidence in yeah, yourself, you know? Sure. Even doing it wrong you better do it wrong to the best of your a hundred percent if you're you wrong gotta, you gotta hundred percent you gotta yeah. act like you're super confident even though if you're not 100 percent sure and you're like hey this is gonna work well you can always <laughs> go back to like the times when you saw results from something you did yeah and if you did that rinse and repeat a dozen times you yeah. at least have that dozen yeah, times right that you hey this is the result and it's consistent with everything that i've yep. done yeah. yep 
Yeah, I mean, there's there's plenty of times where you're, you know, you get into a situation and you're like, well, I think I know how to navigate through this, but then somebody else will give you their opinion. And, and in the back of your head, it could be somebody that knows nothing. Mm. And you totally know that they know nothing, but they're going to tell you something and you're going to go home and you're driving home and you're like, what if they're right? Yeah. But you know better and you know you know better. Right. You know, I'm sure you see it in the draft world too. You know things. You know certain things, but if Joe Schmo off the street came by and said, you shouldn't, he shouldn't look like that, you'd be like, maybe not. Mm. Yeah, but you have to keep to your own principles too. Yeah. Yes. You have to yes. sometimes yep. shut out. Well, there's, yeah. a, there's, a part of, there's a part of you that still is eager to grow and learn, right? And expand. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But That's then there's a part of you that has that. fundamental, like, <clears throat> like you said, principles mm -hmm. yep. that you stand by that are, I mean, I think part of your values and belief system, right? And yeah. that could differ from somebody else. It doesn't yeah. mean it's right or wrong. It just means it's yours. Yeah. That's, you know what yep. I mean? That's the way that you're feeling about. It. And for me personally, if I meet if I meet somebody that thinks that they know it all, you're not somebody I want to hang around with. Yeah, There's, right. so you have to have an open, especially mm -hmm. in this industry and working yeah. with animals and yeah. And like you, you said, you learn something money. every day. Exactly. And I, I mm -hmm. fully yep. agree with that. Like, and every single horse has something to teach you. Yeah. Yeah. You know. And if you think it doesn't, then try again. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Right. Yep. Yeah. Even, even the easy ones, they have something something to tell you yep absolutely absolutely and actually the 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 tougher the horse the the more the lessons yeah because then you have to like you did with the the Clydesdales that were that were um free spirits <laughs> <laughs> feral's feral has like a negative connotation we'll just call them free spirits <laughs> kind of <laughs> no but i mean they were feral they didn't yeah. touch they didn't get touched nope. you know and like yeah. every day yeah you think you make progress and then you might be 10 steps behind or whatever yep. but um yeah i mean it's there i find that the people that sometimes are in more danger are the people that are kind of stagnant in their learning yeah like so would you say that like continuous learning and expanding and um almost testing your own values is something that equestrians yeah. need mm -hmm. to do even if they're not professionals just yeah. like in general Definitely. people yeah. that are like riding or getting into it or even maybe they're novice and you know they're just starting out or whatever yeah. but learning is you know yeah and you have to be open-minded i I'm, <laughs> I'm not as good at Davinia at reading my books. <laughs> <laughs> she's well, gonna, she's gonna let you borrow some. A stack of them. <laughs> <laughs> you read like real books. I got like I I at one point I had started with trying to get my course designer license and uh, and then it kind of stopped and then but I have all of these books about it. And <laughs> Every now and then I, you know, I get excited. I read my books again. Yeah, there you go. You just like hang with Davinia more. <laughs> <laughs> no, see, I can't do those because I, my fiance every night will put on a movie. Yeah. And it's like 11 o'clock at night. And I'm like, why are you going to start a movie? I'm one of those people. I got to know how it ends. I can't start a book. I have to know how it ends. <laughs> or you fall asleep and you dream about some kind of ending. And it's like, no, can't. Can't do it. I'll put a movie on and, it'll, and then it'll shut it off. Yeah. Like 45 minutes into it. And oh, you're no. like, no. That's like playing a know. song. <laughs> playing a song halfway through. And then, oh, I want to listen to another song. I can't. Oh, I do that I all day long. I, I do that can't all do it. Day long. I <laughs> Like ADD. You're like, uh -huh. oh wait, yep. the blue is okay. Yep. 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 I was a little shocked you didn't change more on the way to Indiana and back. Oh my gosh. You were driving. You were reading your book. <laughs> there you go. Full circle. Education is number one. I love it. That's awesome. So we're probably going to wrap up. I have two last questions. Okay. okay. First, I want to acknowledge you both for jumping on and for sharing your education, your background, everything you're doing in the horse world, and how much I appreciate and love working with you guys. We like I've, working with you, too. Yeah. Well, yay. <laughs> I love it. Um, so I have two last questions, and they're both fun, or they can be. Okay. Um, and they're not loaded, but some people might look at them as loaded, but... So oh, I'm worried. Oh, no, don't, don't be worried. Don't be worried. 
<laughs> you'll, you'll both survive, I promise. Um, so it's called the three golden nugget questions, okay? <laughs> well, not three questions. Three gold nugget answers, okay. So if you, with all of your experience combined and everything that you've done in the horse world, all your growth, everything, <laughs> like every, all your books, everything, right? <laughs> If, you, if all of that had faded away, but out of all of it, you could leave three key things, gold nuggets, to leave behind for people that are in the horse industry or in the horse world that they could count on and grow from and excel in their journey with their horses. What would those three be? And you can take a minute and think about them. They could be a phrase. They could be a sentence. It could be a paragraph. Whatever those three gold nuggets of knowledge or wisdom or whatever, what would those three be? You want to go first? I have one. Okay. And, it's, and, I ju- and I just thought of it because I think it's, and, and, and in some of your stories, it's all I could think of too. <laughs> in any of the horse sports, listen, st- stop and listen if you see some old timers yes. talking. Stop and listen because if yes. you can even pull, they know more than... They've forgotten, they've forgotten more than, more than you've learned ever. in your entire no, life. Yes, that is the best phrase. I've heard that so yep. many times, and I love that. Uh-huh. Say that one more time. They've forgotten more than you've learned in your entire yep. lifetime. That's wow. how much they know. Yep. Wow. Listen, I love that. Yep. Listen to the old timers. If you can just pull a couple yep. little tidbits. Yep. Of information out. Yep. Or even have a conversation. There's so much lost education that yep. died with people. Yes. That, so much lost. Yes. And, and we live in a generation that people are a little more narrow-minded. They mm-hmm. like to think that yes. they're invincible. Yep. They're, they, they know everything, you mm-hmm. know, and nobody wants to listen to those stories, but those yep. stories tell so much, oh, and there's well, so much knowledge. information. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Awesome. So mm-hmm. your number one nugget is talk to some old folks mm-hmm. and see that what have, kind of... That have been in it that lifetime. Have been in it. Yeah. Yep. Lifetime. Yep. Yep. So find an old farmer or an old breeder or an old <laughs> trainer or something. Because chances are they'll... And you got to be old. You got to be in your 80s. You got to be in your <laughs> we, 70s. We always, we always <laughs> joke that when we're old and see now, we're going to be sitting on a porch in our rocking chairs. No, we've already started this. We have a book. Oh, good. That, that we write things down because yeah. when... Like, we're going to be new friends one day. <laughs> we're going to have forgotten about Wait, each Wait, you other. mean like 51st date friends? <laughs> and we're, That's us. <laughs> when we're old ladies sitting in our rocking chairs, I like, we always joke about how one day we're going to look back on this moment and we're going to laugh about it because, I mean, what else do you have? It's great. I mean... I guess positivity is a... Yeah. So you're... You got to stay positive. You got to stay positive. And surround yourself with positive people because one surround negative yourself. person can ruin it for everyone. Can be like a poison. Yeah. yeah. For sure. Literally. For sure. Yep. What's your second one after old timers? So you, yours is stay positive and surround yourself with positive people. What's your yep. second one? I know you the got gold nuggets. The first one was really good. <laughs> the first one was really good. Between the, Come on. the two of us, we have three. <laughs> yes, you have three. You have three. So two left, two left. And you have one left. I'm keeping track. <laughs> don't be afraid to ask others for help. Yes. If you're stuck on something, one. don't be so mm-hmm. narrow-minded or so pig-headed or whatever you want to call it that you can't ask somebody for help because you can always use help. Awesome. That's good advice. And there are so many different things in, in horses. Mm-hmm. You know, riding, driving, and yeah. all the little things that go along with every... And sometimes you can take... Yeah, you can take something from one discipline and yep. you can put it into another. Mm-hmm. I rode... Um, Cross-training the horses. Yeah. The best thing. Yep. Cross-training. Yep. Awesome. When, when we, uh, Don't I keep your Canada. horses siloed. Yeah. <laughs> right? <laughs> Have them be multifaceted. Yeah. Have, have you ever seen that? Um, it's a little like cartoon drawing, and it's a dressage horse, and he's in a therapist chair. And he's yes. Like, <laughs> <laughs> he's like, she wants another circle, but it's still not perfect. Oh know? my god, I love it. Yes, I love it. Uh, yeah, my I, I always find what's great with the horses is you can do them in the ring. You get them out on a trail. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Diversify their experience. Things. Yeah. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. Yeah, for sure. Change things up all the yep. time. Sometimes we chase the carriage. Yeah, <laughs> change things up, and maybe the third one for you could be change things up for yourself too, because you did riding, and now you do driving. Mm-hmm. So change it up and 
become skilled in multiple ways. You should see her ride a horse and drive one out in front of her. Drive two out in front of her. Yep. What? Yeah. Yep. Which people don't do. No. No, people don't do that. <laughs> no, they don't. That was it. You were hiding that one. You were hiding that one. I might have to have you guys back on again. We have more to unfold here. That's awesome. Okay, and the last question is... What is your definition of empowerment? Confidence, I guess. Yeah. I think so. You can't have, you can't feel empowered without confidence. So confidence. Yeah. Cool. What about you? <laughs> you can't piggyback. No piggybacking, Savinia. <laughs> um, I think it goes back to, you know, you have to stay, stay true to yourself and what, what mm. you know. You're doing correctly. Mm -hmm. You're doing correctly. Yeah. Awesome. So if people want to find you guys or find your training or anything like that, where can we look? Where can we go to serve you? Where can we go to? We're both out of Brattlebrook Barns in Marlboro, Connecticut. Awesome. And both of us do a little freelance stuff on our own too. So Awesome. So like private training yeah. or that kind of thing. So mm -hmm. you're on Facebook, Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. Both. Showcase some of your stuff on there. Awesome. Yep. Thank you girls so much. Thanks for having us. Thanks for being here. <laughs> awesome. Let me know some of your biggest takeaways in the comments below and make sure to share this with somebody you think needs to hear it and stick around for some more educational content coming up right now.